On this episode of This Week in Linux, TeamViewer 13 was announced, and they're bringing native Linux support to their remote desktop software. We saw many distro releases this week, and in fact, we'll be taking a look at six of them. We talk about how to get Microsoft Office 2016 on Linux, and later in the show, we'll jump into some Linux gaming, one of which is a little bit skin crawly. All that and much more coming up. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital, and this is your weekly source for Linux GNU's. Codeweavers announced this week that Crossover 17.0 was released, and with this, they're bringing support for Microsoft Office 2016 to Linux. So you can utilize Crossover 17 to use Microsoft Office 2016. Now, it kind of seems weird that it's 2016 or whatever, because while we're in 2017, uh, but Microsoft Office 2016 is the latest version. They release a new version roughly every three years or so. So the next one is probably going to be in 2019. If you've never heard of Crossover before, it is a commercial version, not the commercial version, a commercial version of Wine made by Codeweavers. And Codeweavers does a lot of development for Wine, and they host the Wine website and a lot of other things. So by, by purchasing Crossover, you are contributing monetarily to Wine in a way. Not exactly, but in a way. You also get like easy installs for Windows apps with with uh, crossover and uh, portable portable virtual Windows environment, or they as they call it bottles wine bottles. Anyway, uh, and also another cool thing that you get with uh, crossover is a shared clipboard between wine apps and your Linux desktop. So if you are interested in using crossover to maybe convince some people to switch over to Linux, then so they, they can have Microsoft Office 2016. This is a, a good opportunity for that. So even less reasons to use Windows. TeamViewer 13 was announced this week, and it is now native for Linux. Well, I mean, it, it always is run, it's been running on Linux for a very long time, but it no longer needs Wine to accomplish all of the features that it previously did. Now, it also has native 64-bit without requiring 32-bit dependencies like it used to for a compensation of the Windows, like, wine packages and stuff. So the transition actually allows that to be done as well. And they're also going to be available for uh, Debian and RPM packages. So TeamViewer is probably the go-to remote support software on Linux because it's just it's easy to use for both the, the remote supporter and the supportee. It's a lot user-friendly for pretty much everybody... It is proprietary, so that's unfortunate, but overall, um, it has saved me a lot of headaches in the past, so I'm really happy to see that it is now completely native, and they're using, to, in order to do that, they've transitioned their interface to a Qt-based uh, user interface, so that is pretty cool, because I'm a big fan of Qt. Now, they did also announce that they're going to have initial Wayland support, but it has very limited in what it can do, and that's because Wayland... Is a is a protocol that doesn't really support the i the process of remote support, support the remote support. That was weird. Anyway, the Wayland support has to be done on the compositor side, not the Wayland side. So that creates some complications because there are so many different competing compositors because the desktop environments have to build their own compositing thing. Because Wayland's not really a display server replacement; it's more of a protocol. So. Uh, it's just a little bit more complicated, so it'll be a little while before TeamViewer will support the Wayland side of distros. But they are talking about that it is part of the roadmap that they are working on. Music Cube 0.31.0 was released this week. Music Cube is a cross-platform, terminal-based audio engine, library, player, and server written in C++. The cross-platform part is Linux, Windows, macOS, and Android. Now, this is really cool because if you've ever heard of CMUS, this is kind of like that. So you can have you know, listen to music inside of your terminal. But this also works as a server, so it kind of has uh, a combination of multiple types of software. So like there's, there's a lot of music daemons, and there's some clients for those, but not 
typically they don't have one like built into the, like their own the whole all in one thing. But they but the Android app is probably the most interesting to me because it has the Android apps has support for the remote control, so you can you can control your terminal player through the Android app, but you can also stream the audio from your terminal player to the Android app. So that is pretty interesting. To point out though, the Music Cube Android app is not available in the Play Store. You have to sideload the APK instead, which you can download from the GitHub repo that is linked in the show notes. ArgBash 2.5.1 was released this week. ArgBash is a code generator for parsing bash arguments. Uh, bash doesn't come with command line argument parsing. Well, I mean, you, you, you have to build it into yourself in a, in a variety of different ways. You could do it with like if statements or case system or like however you want to do it. There's multiple ways, but it's a, it's a cumbersome way to, thing to do. Um, so most script, bash scripts do not have any kind of argument handling at all. And in the, on this website, they say that based on their research, that 84.6% of bash scripts they could find didn't have command line arguments. And that's probably because, one, people don't necessarily need to have them, but also it is kind of cumbersome. So this is a script, or I guess it's a script, but it's also a tool for scripts, where they say that it uh, you write a short definition and let argbash modify your script so that it magically starts to expose a command line interface to your users and arguments passed using this interface as variables. Essentially what it does is that you put in your script, you give it... Um, you give it some like references of like uh, it, it's ba- they have their own syntax. You use the syntax to create arguments that you want to use, and then it will generate that script for you, and you just apply it to your own script. It's actually a really cool idea, and I've given a little bit of uh, a try, not that much, so I can't really say whether it's good or not. So based on my l- limited testing, it does look pretty like pretty interesting with a lot of potential. Next up in the show is Bode Linux 4.4. Bode Linux 4.4 was released this week, and with it comes with a lot of software updates and security patches from the repositories of Ubuntu 1604 LTS. They also upgraded the kernel to 4.13 and the Enlightenment EFL library to 1.19.1. This is mostly just a maintenance update but it is nice to see continued support for any distro, uh, and especially if you're interested in looking at checking out Enlightenment. Well, more like, not necessarily Enlightenment, Enlightenment 17, which is now Moksha, or Moksha? I think it's Moksha uh, fork. That's what Bodhi Linux uses. So if you want to try out like an Enlightenment flavor variant uh, on Ubuntu, then check out Bodhi Linux. Peppermint 8 Respin was released this week, and with it comes a lot of interesting changes, such as upgrade to Nemo 3.4.7, which is a a much needed thing because the the Nemo dependency of the Cinnamon desktop has been removed, so that's much better. Uh, so that's good for them to update to that. The Papyrus Fork theme of Papyrus, which I really like the name of that, uh, it was updated to support uh, newer newer features and versions to, of XFC, XFWM4, GTK, and their icon set. Advert Blocker was reinstalled in Peppermint 8 Respin. LightDM GTK Greeter was replaced with Slick Greeter. They disabled the GTK Overlay Scroll Bars, which is, is nice because it actually gets in the way sometimes, depending on the application. So I can see why people will, might not like that. Uh, they've added Mint translations from the Linux Mint team so that certain aspects of it will, will automatically translate through those. And they've updated the kernel to 4.10, as well as all the 1604 maintenance and security bug fixes and stuff like that. So Peppermint 8 Respin, check it out if you're interested. Um, as, a, as a request to the people who make Peppermint, you, could you uh, consider not using the word Respin? Because when I first saw the news for this, I was very confused about what this meant because I was wondering, like, it's a respin of what? But what they mean is a respin or a rebuild or refresh of the uh, the particular version of Peppermint 8. So if you look at, like, most distros, when they say respin, they're referring to, like, a modification of some kind, whereas this one is a just an updated version. So, 
you know, don't have to or anything. I'm just saying, like, maybe consider, like, a rebuild or a refresh or something like that. Or just, like, Peppermint 8.1. That's good, too. This week, Puppy Linux 7.5 was released and now supports BIOS and UEFI. The Puppy Linux 7.5 32-bit version has kernel 4.4.95 so that it works better with older hardware, and which makes sense because there's no reason to have 32-bit on new hardware. The 64-bit version has kernel 4.9.58, so if you have newer hardware, you would use this version instead. If you've never heard of Puppy Linux, Puppy Linux in their own words, is small, runs in RAM, and is lightning fast. Very versatile and good fun. It has everything a novice will need while loving full, allowing full control to the experienced user. I disagree with that. The whole everything the novice will need part, uh, no. It's, it's a little bit over the top. It's a little over the head of most novice people. Most novice users aren't going to be comfortable with using something that is so unique. But Puppy Linux is fantastic, and has and the the RAM usage is very cool. the The Joe Windows Manager is an interesting choice, but they've been using that for a very long time. But overall, Puppy Linux is a really cool thing. And Xenial Pup is the release for seven point five, which provides packages to the sixteen oh four repo of Ubuntu. Puppy Linux seven point five release ISO was three hundred and thirty megs, so very small, and I'd say if you're if you're new to Puppy and you're interested into it and looking into it, um, something that's good to know is that you you don't need to use like a hard drive. You don't need to install it. You can just run it in RAM, and then save your progress or your persistent data to another drive, if to a drive if you want to, or even a CD if like if you want to as well. But what's really cool is that Puppy Linux has a layered file system so that you can manipulate things without modifying like underneath it so you just create layers on top so that's a really interesting way of uh, managing a file system but anyway i would say that it's it's puppy linux is a great distro but not really that good for beginners but still if you're interested in checking out uh you'll find links to the show in the show notes in the video description linux aio is uh linux all-in-one they released this week that the Ubuntu 17 Flavors All-in-One ISO has been has been released. It has support for Ubuntu, Kubuntu, Ubuntu Budgie, Ubuntu Mate, Zubuntu, and Lubuntu 1710 releases. It has support for both 32-bit and 64-bit versions, so you can you can download the ISO that has a pack, has a pack for both. You can there's actually one that has 32-bit and 64 built in the same ISO. Or you can just get 32-bit of all the versions and all the flavors, or 64-bit version ISO for all the flavors. Linux AIO uses SourceForge for their downloads, and they archive all the ISOs into 7-zip files, or 7-z files, which you'll need P7-zip or some other kind of 7-zip extraction tool. Most distros have this built-in default for their art, their extracting archiving system, so like Nemo and Mint or... Dolphin in Plasma or, you know, things like that for Nautilus in Gnome Gnome based distros, you could you could just usually right click those files and then extract from there. Uh, some of them require you to open the files and then extract from the, the built in manager rather than the actual file manager itself, but the archiver, I mean. If you're interested in that, check it out. It's actually really cool. I've placed, tested it for quite a few years and many different iterations. And it works really nicely if you're wanting to try out all the various different flavors. Debian 9.3 was released this week. Debian 9.3 is a maintenance and bug fix release, and including a, mostly just security security fixes and bug fixes and things like that. But also this week, they Debian announced that Debian 10 is going to have unattended upgrades ability so that you can do automatic installation of security upgrades. And they're also going to add support for extended 4 64-bit feature to the SysLinux bootloader. Debian also announced sources.debian.org, or DebSources, a platform for viewing the Debian source code via the web in a searchable form for all Debian releases. This is really cool because it used to be pretty complicated to find the source files for pretty much everything. Um, I mean, it's possible to do it. It was just... It was just uh, time-consuming and a little tedious, but now they're doing it in a much 
a much easier to use and straightforward way. So, very cool. Oroch Linux, uh, or Oroch GNU slash Linux 2.0 was released this week. This is a free software only distro. It's a fork of Triscoll GNU slash Linux. And it uses Linux Libre 4.9.66 LTS Linux kernel. Well, the, the Libre fork of the Linux kernel. It uses Mate 1.12.1, which is kind of old, but still usable. Uh, replaces MDM with LightDM, so that's interesting. It uses, uh, it has by default um, apt because it's based on Ubuntu. Well, it's based on Triscoll, which is based on Ubuntu, which is based on Debian, so it's got apt. Anyway, it also has support for URPMI and USRC for installing packages with RPM and source tarballs. There's a really interesting thing that they do as well that not only is the free software thing that's that's cool too, but like something that's pretty cool that called the uh, package manager simulator. It's a tool that they use so that you can use the syntaxes and other package manager stuff you're used to inside of their in their distro for installing applications. So you can install, uninstall, update, remove packages, and etc. from using the syntax and the commands from any package manager. Like they say, any package manager you you want to. I don't know how far that goes, but like, like if you want to do Pacman Tech Capital S, then the package name it should work. So that's a pretty cool thing. Even though it doesn't use Pacman, it just interprets it back to what it's supposed to be for that distro. That's pretty cool. So Urok uh, GNU slash Linux two point zero. This week, HP, Asus, and Lenovo announced ARM powered laptops. They claimed that some of them claimed to have up to 25 hours of battery life, and they also claimed that they have an, an emulator that does x86 to ARM emulation, so software that is made for x86 should work on these laptops. They haven't really demonstrated if that works or how well that works, so it might be like a performance hit. It's hard to say, but it's an interesting idea. Um, the problem, I think there's a, there's a potential problem for Linux in this case though, is that these arm, these arm laptops, if they become like a popular thing, they might have the same problem that phones do where the support for installing a different OS could be very difficult. So hopefully that won't be the case here. We won't know for sure until after they release them. Mesa 17.3 was, a, was released this week. And with it comes improved Vulkan support for Radeon RAD-V and Intel ANV drivers. I'm not sure if it's RAD-V or just R-A-D-V, but RAD-V sounds more fun. So I'm going to do that. It also comes with uh, S3TC support in Mesa 17.3. Uh, S3TC is S3 Texture Compression. And the reason it was added in this version is because the patent expired that restricted it previously so this is going to be a lot better performance and um, higher compression yield for uh, various different textures and lots of various games mesa 17.3 openmw 0.43.0 was released this week openmw is an open source engine for morrowind it in this 0.43 includes 20 new features including keyboard navigation for menus and visual improvements like water ripples induced by rain and snow. They also include over a hundred bug fixes, I think like a hundred and nine or something like that, for uh, just improvements to the game in general. And what's really cool about this particular, this project, what they do every time they make a release is they release these videos where they're release commentaries. And they're pretty long, they're about 30 minutes or so, depending on you know how big the release is. But what they do is that they, they go in and show you all the various different things that they've changed, and they demonstrate things, and they explain them in a very like specific, uh, narrow way, so that you can like instead of just reading the the blog post itself, you can see all the different things that they've changed. It's a really cool uh, thing that a lot of projects should do, and it's a it's a good example of what people of what some projects should take a look at and consider maybe doing themselves. But anyway, Open MW zero. Point four three point zero. Polyball 3D Racing Platformer was released out of early access this week. 
the game is a 3D platformer with a racing element. It actually it's like in the same vein as Super Monkey Ball, if you've ever played that game back in the day. It's a really interesting thing that has like it's essentially like a platform that you use to you you basically drive around a, a ball of various different types of shapes and sizes and all kinds of stuff and terrain that's just really chaotic most of the time. So it's it's an interesting approach and uh I'm definitely looking forward to trying this out. So yeah, and you can also do like these custom shape balls. They all perform the same way, but they all look different. So you can get like lots of weird, interesting shapes and stuff. But anyway, Polyball, 3D racing platformer. Steam platform specific wish lists are now a thing, sort of, kind of. It allows you to go into your settings for your account and choose which operating systems that you wish for games to support. But this, if if as far as the wish list things go, it only works if you only if you check just one platform. So if you choose SteamOS plus Linux, and that's the only one you check, then it will show you in the list when you search should in the search show you the the you know it should like tailor it to what platform you choose. But if you choose it for the wish list. As long as you choose only one, it will also help you. It'll also help potentially show developers that people are looking for. There might be demand for their game on the Linux platform. So if you haven't done this, check the links in the video description or show notes, and uh, it'll take you directly to your account settings where you can check the Linux box. Valve announced that Steam has stopped supporting Bitcoin for purchasing of games. This actually makes pretty pretty much a ton of sense for them to do this. Not because Bitcoin's not valuable, it actually it is very valuable right now, but it's a very it's a volatile currency um and that's just kind of like inherently how it's just built. It becomes it's it's kind of not intended to be volatile, but it's not surprising that it is. But the reason why it's a good decision on their part to do this is because the transaction fees for uh, Bitcoin transactions are around $20, maybe even like $25 or so per transaction. Where it used to be, when they when they instituted this policy to support Bitcoin, the transaction fees were $0.20. Cents. So it made sense back then for them to do this, but now that the transaction fees are about $20, there are some cases where the transaction fee is more, even like, three times more than the game's price itself. So it just makes sense for them to not support Bitcoin anymore once it's got to that level. Uh, it's unfortunate for people who were previously using Bitcoin to purchase games, but I, I think it makes sense. This week on the Gaming on Linux website, Liam posted a really interesting article about the another way to look at the Linux market share on Steam, or a different perspective. What's what the the idea is that someone posted uh, hard penguin suggested something to Liam, and he basically ran with it, and did some research and gathered some data about this, and turns out it's really interesting about you know this perspective of what could be the reason why the percentage was low. I always said it's because uh, Steam rarely that you know offers the survey to Linux users, but and that that's probably partially p- a part of it. I, I don't think that that's an accurate thing to say. I just think that there this is a interesting perspective to add more context to it. Uh, so I think that the number of users of Linux gaming has gone up, but the percentage has gone down based on the amount of people who have started using Steam rather than the amount of people who use or do not use Linux. In this article, the idea is that China and reg- regions in that area have recently become a market for Steam in general. So the suggestion was to look at how many people were using the simplified Chinese as their language you know, for in the statistics. And through this process, we saw the percentage going down. And around September, it started like kind of not plummeting, but eh, kind of, as far as the percentage-wise goes. But then if you look at the amount of people who are going up and that are simplified Chinese speakers, that's basically the exact same time frame. So the percentage of Linux users has actually gone down, not because of the amount of users, but the amount of people who are not Linux users has skyrocketed. So the percentage is going down because there are way more people that are using Windows because China is a very 
Windows heavy region. So it's just an interesting thing that if you want to take a look at this article, I have a link in the show notes to learn more about it and read more in depth. But I thought this was quite um, quite an interesting thing, and I'm very appreciative of Liam and Gaming on Linux for making this article. Because I would never even thought about this. So it's a whole new perspective. Besiege is a physics-based building game, and they recently released support for multiplayer and a level editor this week. The multiplayer aspect is a very highly requested feature from the community, so this is a fantastic thing for the community play of Besiege. I actually just talked with a few people uh, about a week ago, just randomly about this particular game, and how they wish that it had multiplayer. So, there you go. It does now. Empires of the Undergrowth has re- been released on Early Access. It's uh, it's an RTS that has a pretty unique and uh, kind of creepy vibe to it. You essentially control a colony of ants and attack other bugs and other colonies, and it's it's an interesting RTS approach. I've uh, I'm not really that much of into RTS, but this this is such a unique and interesting approach to the concept. I actually might try it out, even if it does creep me out a little bit, uh, you know, skin crawly kind of thing. But it's still it's pretty interesting. So if you're interested in having a uh, have your skin crawl a little bit, check out Empires of the Undergrowth. Dirty Cal Redo patch has been uh, announced and released. The patch is for the huge Dirty Cal uh, vulnerability. Now this is actually something that the name is not really. It's it's kind of a, a confusing name because it doesn't really mean what people might think it means. First off, I just want to point out that the patch is, is for a new iteration of a previous bug. So the the bug that of Dirty Cow in 2016 was fixed, but it created it created another bug that needed to be fixed that was recently in, uh, discovered and patched. So this is not as bad as it was last year, even though the name kind of implies that it is, but it isn't. So huge Dirty Cow only applies to what it if what it affects, not the severity. So the name, the huge part. Is not a severity a severity thing of like how bad it is or anything. It's not a huge problem. It's just the thing it affects is named huge. It has the that that naming scheme. In programming, paging is a well, I won't mess with that programming, but in like in operating system development, paging is a memory management scheme by which a computer stores and retrieves data from secondary storage for use in main memory, kind of like swap. Most commonly recognized as swap. Uh, on x86, the standard page size is 4 kilobytes. And then there's another one that's that's got 2 megabytes for the page size, and it's called and it's called huge pages. And then there's a gigantics pages that's for 1 gigabyte for the each page size. So the particular issue applies to those huge pages, and that's why it's called huge dirty cow. The particular thing in question here is called, is the transparent huge pages or the THP, and this bug was found there. That was a long way of going about saying that while this is something that to be uh, that needs to be patched and needs to be corrected as soon as possible, it's not as skin crawly as the previous topic. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show, please hit that like button. And if you'd like to get more, be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere. Just a reminder, the show is live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern. So join us in the live chat room to discuss all the Linux good news each week. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.